I'm Dr. Joseph M.T., Department of Sociology, University of Mumbai, and this is the e Shala project on religion and society. Now we are going to module 20, which looks at the construction of religious identities in Indian modernity. In this module, we will look at the central idea of modernity. Modernity is usually understood as coming from a Western European location, historically post-enlightenment. And this is sometimes called as European modernity. Here in this module, we are making an assertion of Indian modernity. Now, modernity may be a mindset, it may be a philosophical stand, it may be a practice. And modernity in India is sometimes characterized as a derivative or a derived modernity under the influence of colonialism. Now, in such an Indian modernity, how does different religious identities evolve? Because the modern way of making a distinction between religious and the secular and the, the modern, very modern kind of intervention of the colonial administrators and others in India have had very important kind of influences in the way that we Indians have constructed our identities in terms of religion. On the one side is this modernity that we are talking about. On the other side is the very specific South Asian character of religiosity. Now both of these have, have had an interplay with one another, giving rise to very specific ways of understanding religious identities in India. And this is what we are going to look at in this module. Exploring Indian Modernity and Religious Identities Sudipta Kaviraj writes that one striking fact in the study of comparative colonialism is how the different religious groups responded to the colonial presence. He argues that the presence of Christianity caused enormous internal transformations within the mainstream Hindu society. Within Hinduism, it gave rise to at least two different trends with far-reaching consequences for the development of Hindu religion. Firstly, by drawing Hindu intellectuals into religious and doctrinal debates with Protestant missionaries on rationalist terms. This forced proponents of Hindu doctrinal justification to change their character. Such changes fueled attempts to harmonize religion with a rationalist picture of the world. It is this rational transformation which brought about far-reaching changes within Hinduism of the kind that Indian society had never seen. Secondly, the colonial state itself reflected its initiatives through Orientalist conceptions of Indian society. These conceptions emphasized the fact that unlike an earlier golden past, Indian society was a deeply divided and weakened one in the present period. Not surprisingly, the colonial rulers withheld certain Western practices and modified others, making them relevant to the prevailing situation. It may be worth noting here that the category of Hinduism itself has been the object of growing debate not only in terms of whether such a category constitutes a genuine historical category or whether it involves a construction put together under modernity during the colonial rule in India. Lorenzen writes that there are scholars who claim that Hinduism was constructed, invented or imagined by British scholars and colonial administrators in the 19th century and did not exist in any meaningful sense before this time period. Those who claim this constructionist argument are Vasudha Dalmia, Robert Frickenberg, Christopher Fuller, John Holy, Gerard Larson, Harjot Oberoi, Brian Smith and Heinrich von Streitenkron. W. C. Smith is considered to be an important precursor to these scholars. Romila Tapper and Dermot Killingly have offered somewhat similar arguments but both display greater sensitivity to historical ambiguities and distribute the construction of distinctly modern Hinduism among British Orientalists and missionaries and indigenous nationalists and communalists. Carl Ernest writes about early Muslim references to Hindus and their religion but he joins the above scholars in claiming that the terms do not correspond to any indigenous Indian concept either of geography or of religion. J. Lane agrees with Smith and his modern epigons that Hinduism was invented in the 19th century but credits the invention to the Indian rather than to the British. Given such an understanding of his development, it stands to reason that Hindu identity is in fact an umbrella concept that holds within its fold a vast variety of sects and cults who have their own religious practices and beliefs and who also constitute religious communities on their own right. 
engineer in 1991 writes that primordial identities have assumed a new significance in south asian countries in particular and other third world countries in general he points out that the assertion of religious identity in the process of democratization and modernization should not be seen only as a religious fanaticism or fundamentalism it should also be seen as a method by which deprived communities in the backward society seek to obtain a greater share of power government jobs and economic resources the reassertion of muslim identity should be seen as neither a purely religious or ethnic phenomenon nor a purely political or economic one engineer argues that it is commonly understood that politicians manipulate ethnic communal and caste identities and thus aggravate social tensions for gaining votes of these groups and that this is a comparatively modern phenomenon looking historically at how these identities have emerged in the colonial period he argues that one of the first systematic divisions between hindu and muslim elite emerged in the late 19th century over the question of linguistic identity persian was replaced by english at higher courts and by urdu at lower ones maharaja kishan prasad of banaras and many others began to demand that the court language be written in devanagari whereas sir said ahmed khan and others insisted on urdu written in the persian script this linguistic division turned out to be a communal division too all those who supposed supported the cause of urdu were muslims and those who supported the cause of devanagari were hindus engineer observes that this conflict was not purely a question of cultural and linguistic identity but also of a question of livelihood most of the government administrative and court jobs were dependent on the language used by these officers after the dissolution of the mogul empire the social and political elite especially among the muslims who were mainly dependent on the jobs provided by the erstwhile mogul empire were keen to see the continuation of persian so that to protect their occupations and livelihoods it was sir said said ahmed khan who campaigned for the modern education among the muslim elite and induced them to go for it almost half a century after the hindus had taken to it especially in bengal thus the muslim elite was much more dependent on administrative posts where work was done in urdu hence the first sharp division emerged among the two elites based on separate linguistic and religious identities notwithstanding the alternative narratives within this dominant narrative of religious identity in the context of modern india it is important to point out that religious identities have emerged largely in relationship to how modernity has developed within the indian subcontinent if there are occasion in which identities get more sharply defined then they must be accounted for in the growing communalization of society equally it may be pointed out that religious identities have also flourished in situations where modernity has been defined in strongly economic terms in the case of the sikh identity and its role in the khalistan movement may be seen here as a case in point harjot oberai writes that the crisis of the 1980 was a consequence of the economic inequalities generated by the green revolution in the punjab countryside which were in conflict with the cultural ethos of the sikhs the rising tide of inequalities in the punjab did not easily blend with the dominant ethos of sikh religious tradition which demanded a just moral economy based on equitable distribution of wealth and resources shinder purewal argues that the crisis of 1980 uh, was the doing of small but powerful class of capitalist farmers or the kulaks they are the ones who benefited the most from green revolution technology in their struggle against the commercial and industrial bourgeois the sikh kulaks invoke the ideology of sikhism and their religious identity to build a common bond with the marginal and landless sikh peasantry who had been further marginalized by the green revolution in the name of sikhism the kulaks sought to strengthen the domination over home market punjab getting the anandpur sahib resolution implemented all through seeking a separate nation of khalistan according to purewal the rise of bindranwale and the demand for khalistan were clearly in accordance with the logic of kulaks politics though bindranwale recruited youth from marginalized peasantry his political program of uniting the sikhs against the hindus served the interest of the kulaks here in both the examples we observe that how other factors which were initially socio economic nature gets converted into religious assertion religious identity and the political sphere Singh writes that the concept of communalism and secularism provide useful conceptual tools for the analysis of the role of Indian nationalism in the cultural modernization of the nation. Secularism is a process of modernization. Its spread implies that various issues and events in personal and social life are evaluated not from a religious point of view but utilitarian. With an increase in the process of secularization, the various spheres of social life 
which formerly were guided by religiously ordained norms, are exempted from its hold and are increasingly governed by norms which tend to be rational or hedonistic or both. Singh argues that the kind of Indian nationalism which Gandhi advocated was rooted in the Hindu tradition, but at the same time it was non-communal. Secularism for Gandhi did not mean a a religiosity, but the spirit of religious tolerance which he postulated on the basis of universalistic ethic of Hinduism itself. His conception of Indian polity was entirely non-communal and yet non-secular in the strictly Western sense of the term. Jafre Lot in his essay titled Hindu Nationalism Strategic Syncretism in Ideology Building writes that how socio-religious socio reform movements reinterpret tradition within the process and framework of modernization as an originary moment of nationalism in India. Engineer writes that like the Ram Janam Bhumi Babri Masjid controversy communalized Indian politics to an extent like no issue had done since the partition period. Initially, the Muslim leaders who formed the Babri Masjid Action Committee took quite an aggressive attitude on the matter. However, it was no match for the majoritarian politics espoused by the Hindu right during this period. What emerged in the decades that followed was a practice of electoral mobilizations deeply motivated by religious identities and groups involved. Not only did religion feature importantly in electoral politics uh, of 1989 general elections, it would also be wrong to suggest that besides religion, caste as well became an important marker for electoral mobilization in the realm of democratic politics. Such a hardening of religious identities and their ideologies within the context of Indian modernity clearly raises the question of the extent to which modernity has been able to manipulate the development of religious identities so as to encourage the development of a more inclusive social environment wherein the forces of communalism and religious intolerance could be effectively undermined. Unfortunately, modernity in India has failed to achieve such a construction of civil society. While the secularization of society continues to be deep felt aspiration among large sections of liberal elites in the country, it does appear as if with the passage of time the context of Indian modernity recognizes identities have not been not only hardened but also become more conservative in the way that the practice of religion comes to get realized in the everyday world. Thus, with increasing prosperity among, resulting from migration and globalization amongst the different religious communities, modernization has come to mean a more heightened and more pervasive spread of one's religious practices. In real terms, this has meant an ever-increasing investment in the religious economies of the various religious communities. Not only is this witnessed in the expanding activity of constructing new and opulent places of worship, it also manifests itself in extravagant display of wealth and religious symbolism on the occasion of religious festivals. Other Discourses of Religious Identities Within Indian Modernity Given the growing majoritarian sentiment that has propelled the rise of religious identities under modernity, it is important to note that besides the Muslim identity which we have already dealt with above, there is also identity of the Christian and more so the tribal Christian who has greatly affected the majoritarian discourse of identity in modern India. David Kingsley writes that it's hard in practice to draw a line between advanced primitive religions on the one hand and backward Hinduism on the other. Hinduism is so syncretic that it embraces almost every conceivable religious practice and the Hindu social order is so pervasive that it infiltrates nearly every social group. Nearly always, therefore, there is some remote basis for labeling a primitive tribesman as Hindu and he, being illiterate, is often incapable of asserting himself in the matter. Moreover, because of the vagueness and inclusiveness of Hinduism, the encounter tends to regard it as a residual category. Any person in India is thus a Hindu unless he definitely proves that he is something else. Such a thinking clearly reveals at the terrible dilemma that tribal society was placed in both during colonialism as well as in the period after independence. If Christian missionaries work towards proselytizing the tribals to Christianity thereby giving them a separate identity both in terms of religion as well as in community, the Hindu nationalists were quick to counter this particular approach on the part of the Christian missionaries. As a result, the discourse of Christian identity making identity marking among the tribal groups continues to be one which is disfurred with constant demands on the part of the Hindu nationalists that the Christian tribals should reconvert to Hinduism. G.S. Gure in his book describes tribes as backward Hindus. He divided tribes into three sections. At first are those who are properly integrated, then loosely integrated, and then those who are not being, merely being touched by Hinduism. 
considering the last section, he made the point that the only proper description of these people is that they are imperfectly balanced, integrated classes of Hindu society and that they are really backward Hindus. Virginius Kakha writes that Guria made this argument on the ground that there was much similarity between Hindu religion and animus, tribal religions, and these two possibly cannot be to distinguished from one from the other. His conception shaped the future line of thinking about tribes in India. Religious identity in the context of modern India has also been shaped by Jyoti Rao Phule and Babasaheb Ambedkar. Both these figures provide us with critique of Brahmanism and Brahmanical Hinduism. Gail Ombet writes that Phule presented a very different set of interests and a very different outlook in India from all upper caste elite thinkers of the so-called Indian Renaissance, who have dominated the area awareness of uh, both Indian and foreign intellectuals. Phule viewed upper caste, orthodox religion, and the whole structure of sacred books from the Vedas to the Puranas as alien and weapons of rule. In dismissing totally the dominant religious traditions of India, Pule accepted the assumption that something has to be put in its place. He does not reject the idea of dharma, but rather attempts to establish a universalistic one. One aspect of his rationalism can be seen in the Sadhya Samaj, with his primary emphasis on truth-seeking. It is most significant here that truth-seeking was seen as a quest guided by the individual's own reason and not by the dictates of any religious guru or authoritative text. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar criticized Hinduism because it did not follow the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. He argued that Hinduism is based on graded inequality, especially because of the legitimization of caste system and the position of women in the Hindu society, and there doesn't exist any scope of liberty, equality and fraternity within Hinduism. Dr. Ambedkar fulfilled his Ayala Pledge of 1935 by embracing Buddhism in 1956. After the conversion, he remarked, I'm overjoyed, I'm excited, I feel I've been um, liberated from the hell. He opted Buddhism because it was built on the foundations of liberty, equality and fraternity. What the Buddha called the Dhamma differed from fundamentally from what was called religion at that time. The principal aim of Buddhism is to emancipate suffering humanity. He embraced Buddhism in 1956 in Nagpur. The rise of neo-Buddhist identity in modern India has an interesting trajectory that brings to the fore dynamics of religion and modernity in contemporary Indian society. Period 1992. If Ambedkar conceived of Buddhism as a new civilizational religion that should be embraced by the Hindus' upper and lower caste, it was because he believed that Hinduism, both as a religion and as an identity, was ill-equipped to exist in a modern society. It is for this reason that he suggested replacing Hinduism with Buddhism, which he believed was far more equipped both socially, morally and ethically, as well as spiritually, to enable all Indians to enter into a modern society. Neo-Buddhists, however, failed to achieve this goal. Ever since the existence of 1956, it came to be associated with the scheduled caste and more specifically with the certain numerically dominant groups among the scheduled castes. Fitzgerald to that extent, the neo-Buddhist identity, while many would argue provided a platform for social and ethical transformation of India, ended up becoming the basis for the construction of another minority group within the pantheon of religious identities that make up the Indian society. Conclusion Module 20 In this module, we have looked at the overarching idea of modernity and its application to India and how Indian modernity has facilitated the construction of distinct religious identities in India and we in the contemporary times are aware of how these identities are playing themselves out in the Indian scenario today. So we have looked at a historical development of these identities in the context of modernity. Thank you.